Well, again, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the March Acting for Justice Gathering. My name is Jack Jezreel, and I'm joined by my colleague, Leela Oakley. We both serve on the staff of Just Faith Ministries, and we're just delighted that you could join us tonight for this important presentation. So let's begin, as we always do, our evening in prayer. And tonight's prayer was written by Sister Peggy Boehm, and it comes from the Pax Christi USA website. Let us pray. Christ of peace, the first words you spoke to your disciples after your resurrection were, peace be with you. With us and with all of creation groaning for peace, we implore your mercy and forgiveness as we listen to earth lamenting and people crying, made poor by humanity's acts of aggression. As your disciples of peace and nonviolence, may our first words be at this time of war in the Ukraine, Peace be, with you. Peace, be with you. Peace be with you, people of Ukraine, whose suffering is our suffering, whose cries unite with our cries for peace. Peace be with you, leaders of countries whose use of force and aggression might be transformed into justice that is restorative. Peace be with you, protesters in the streets of Russia whose courage puts you at risk for your lives inspire us to stand up for nonviolence. Peace be with each one of us, that as we cry with our Ukrainian kin, we may be moved to proclaim no more war, war never again. Come, Christ of peace, be with us. Amen. And now it's almost my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's presenter, Bill O'Keefe from Catholic Relief Services. But before I do, I just want to highlight that Just Faith Ministries is collaborating with Catholic Relief Services on a new component for the Just Faith Catholic series. As most of you may know, Just Faith Catholic is now actually three eight-week programs focused on domestic poverty. But in July, we'll be excited to launch a fourth eight-week program focused on global poverty, and happily, this is a collaboration between Just Faith Ministries and Catholic Relief Services. Just Faith and CRS have enjoyed a robust history of mutual support for over 20 years, and we're delighted by this new chapter in our relationship. So now, back to the introduction of tonight's speaker. As Catholic Relief Services Executive Vice President for Mission and Mobilization, Bill O'Keefe, oversees CRS's efforts to build a movement of Catholics and others of goodwill to support CRS's global mission and build action-oriented global solidarity with poor, vulnerable, and marginalized people around the world. These efforts include lobbying Congress and the administration on a range of foreign policy issues and engaging U.S. Catholics in public campaigns to change U.S. foreign policy in ways that promote justice and reduce poverty overseas. Mr. O'Keefe received his Bachelor of Science from Yale University and Master's in Public Policy from the Kennedy School of Government in Har at Harvard. He joined CRS in 1987 as project manager in Tanzania, designing and monitoring community development projects. He has served in a variety of uh, various capacities for CRS and has led CRS government relations and advocacy efforts since 2003 and has served in his current position since 2019. Bill, we are so glad to have you with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you are so much, Jack, for that very kind introduction. And thanks everybody for your interest in this really important topic. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and um, what I'm gonna be doing is focusing mainly on the humanitarian situation and the church's response uh, although in the question and answer, I'm happy to do my best to answer any of the sort of geopolitical kinds of questions that um, are in the news, uh, but folks may be interested in delving into. So let me just share my screen and I'll get going. Okay. Do you see anything yet? We can see it. Um, okay. If you put it into slideshow mode, yeah. it will be rolling. How's that? Great. 
Okay. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, let me just, yeah, so I'm going to give a brief overview of the conflict, um, but really kind of focus on the humanitarian situation, as I said. Um, all of you were as shocked as we were when Russia invaded Ukraine in the early hours of, of uh, Thursday, February 24th. Um, the conflict has really mainly been in the east and south of the country with um, uh, advances by Russian military on Kiev, the capital, Kharkiv, which is the second largest Ukrainian city in the northeast, and then in the south in uh, Mariupol and Kyrgyzstan, Odessa, those cities. Um, as a reminder, Ukraine is a, is a huge country with over 40 million people that has a, a proud uh, and independent history. And um, it's really unprecedented in modern history for uh, at least in European history in the post Second World War era for a um, it's an outright invasion of uh, a major European country like this. As a result of the conflict, over 3 million people have fled and over 1.6 million uh, have fled the country and 1.6 million are displaced within Ukraine. And that figure is, is undoubtedly undercounted because it's, there's so much kind of chaos and instability in the country, it would be very difficult to count. But um, as of the 15th of March, 1.8 million people have fled from Ukraine to the southwest, the upper upper left-hand corner into Poland, another half million or so into Romania, over 300,000 to Moldova, and then um, hundreds of thousands more to Hungary and Slovakia and, and even to Russia and Belarus. Uh, both of which are allies together attacking Ukraine itself. Um, in Ukraine, people are facing severe shortages of food and shelter, water in some cases, and transport. There is uh, very serious incidents of trauma, um, and unknown people have, been, have uh, lost their lives or been injured, but certainly many people and the sense of loss and fear is, uh, it, you know, extreme. They're fleeing within Ukraine, uh, mainly to the west of the country, which is um, where there's uh, not a Russian ground troop presence, but there are uh, air operations, and to the neighboring countries, as I described earlier. The, the worst suffering is in the besieged cities, uh, such as Mario, Mariupol, which there's been a lot of coverage around where um, you know, there's been kind of an unrelenting bombardment and little opportunity for people to free, flee and little opportunity for new supplies, food, water to be brought in. The Ukrainian government has mandated that men aged 18 to 60 need to stay in the country to defend it. Consequently, uh, the displaced and refugees um, are almost all children, women, and the elderly. There are over a million children that have fleed, 90% to 95%, as I said, are children, women, and the elderly. There are also many unaccompanied children, uh, which presents serious safeguarding and protection issues. And... Um, uh, and which is a huge focus for CRS, as you would imagine, and also many elderly and that the, compared to um, refugee and humanitarian crises in Africa and parts of the Middle East, this population is much older and also suffers from um, more of the kind of chronic health problems, diabetes, heart disease that are endemic in Western and European societies and less so and less of an issue in the refugee population in you know, um, Sudan or Ethiopia or in um, the Sahel region. Many people are fleeing by car, which is you know, different also, 
um, and then dispersing to the south and the west once they uh, cross um, outside of Ukraine. Uh, many Ukrainians actually have families in other countries, actually in the United States as well. And so many are trying to, um, to, to, to leave and then pass through countries until they get to where their families are. The earlier refugees that we first saw across tended to have cars, but now we are seeing poor families who are arriving at the border by public transport or on foot. Um, those who don't have relatives, they don't have resources, or they have a loved one fighting close to the border are more likely to stay in the neighboring country while many others, um, as I said, uh, are able and, and want to kind of move on to Germany or to France or to the UK or, uh, or other safe, safe country. Um, this is a picture of a elderly woman and her family arriving at a border town um, in Moldova. And you can see, you can imagine um, that woman, what it was like for her to flee and in what uh, is, you know, that the, the end of winter, but a, a European winter, cold Northern European winter. And um, I can only imagine what a, a shock it is to her um, at this point in her, her life. Thousands of refugees from Ukraine uh, have crossed at this particular border crossing in Moldova, which is pictured above. Um, it's terribly cold. People have to wait for hours and days uh, to cross the border. There's been long lines of cars waiting to um, get across. And, and as I said, it's uh, some people have it's taken days. Um, and uh, and again, with with small children and elderly family members in the cold, uh, it's been extremely difficult. Um, people are also disoriented. Um, they don't know who to trust. Frequently in these situations, there's kind of an information desert because um, you know it's not like this is a planned vacation. I mean, their people did not expect for this to happen. So they had to make very quick decisions, pull together, um, uh, you know, a, a, a suitcase, uh, things that they could carry or fit in their car, and then quickly move towards a border without a clear plan, in, in some cases without even knowing where they were going. Um, there's also a lot of raw emotion, not only the trauma of the, of, of the bombardment and the war, but also the saying goodbye to husbands and brothers on the other uh, side of the border who are remaining to fight and... Uh, you know, the fear of losing loved ones, the fear of never seeing your family again, and the exhaustion of sleepless nights um, of bombardment, it's really taking a toll on people. So um, I want to talk a little bit about what, uh, about the response. Um, since 2014, when the Russia, uh, the first incursion into the eastern part of Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea, CRS has been supporting our Caritas partners in um, providing shelter, livelihoods, and trauma healing to um, displaced people within Ukraine. I actually had the opportunity to go in 2016 to Kiev and Kharkiv uh, with a delegation from CRS where I met our Caritas partners and uh, families who had fled uh, in 2014 from the East. And I was struck by a couple of things, which I think are consistent here. One, um, the Caritas partners were just really competent. They had fantastic young people, really smart, very committed to helping their brothers and sisters. Um, but the, you know, it was a real challenge for those who had fled, finding themselves in a new part of the country, um, looking for shelter, getting assistance from Caritas. Um, but it was quite a difficult, a difficult situation. And, you know, I really personally have been, um, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I feel like I'm able to picture this situation from having been in Kharkiv. And I'll say my daughter also lives in Bulgaria in a in in what looks very similar the kind of Soviet style apartment blocks that you see being destroyed by the Russians. It's really um, 
you know, I, I, I feel like I can really visualize what's going on there. Um, Caritas in Ukraine, there's kind of the, the church, there are two Catholic branches of, uh, uh, in the country. There's a Greek Catholic Ukrainian Catholic church and a Roman Catholic Ukrainian Catholic church. Caritas Ukraine is the sort of Catholic charities of the Greek Catholic church and Caritas Spes is the Catholic charities of the Roman Catholic church. The, um, the head of Caritas Ukraine is actually an American Ukrainian woman who used to work at the Catholic Bishops Conference until a couple of years ago when she decided uh, to apply for and accept a job in Ukraine working for Caritas. Uh, I have been on the phone with her and I can tell you um, she's an incredibly courageous woman, uh, but this is not what she uh, signed up for, as you would imagine. And it's it's uh, unbelievably stressful and challenging job. The heroism, heroism and courage, though, of the Caritas staff in Ukraine are really, um, really just unbelievable. They have 36 offices around the country in the different dioceses of Ukraine, and 34 of them are still up and running. Um, I think it's just incredible, they, the creativity and innovation that allows them to continue operating in the middle of this kind of conflict. Um, parishes, dioceses, dioceses, and really the whole church are also responding courageously as well as the Caritas organizations. Um, I want to just mention the whole Caritas network, which, you know, we in the United States may not even be aware that there is a this amazing global Catholic network of uh, social service and social justice organizations. CRS and Catholic Charities are actually the American Caritas organizations. More or less every country around the world that has any Catholic presence has a Caritas, which is kind of the Catholic charities of the country and the, and, the, and, and in many of the Northern European countries, also the, the CRS of the country. And so the network is very, has, has a huge amount of capacity and I think has really come together in solidarity um, uh, in, in response to this, this situation. But Caritas, Ukraine, Poland, Moldova, Hungary, Slovakia, Romania, they have significant capacity, but they've never faced this kind of disaster. And that's really where CRS comes in. Um, our job is to help them, even these kind of very strong organizations, to scale up quickly and to do things they haven't done before. So before the crisis, before the invasion even happened, we released to them half million dollars of our private resources so they would have cash on hand in order to be able to start a response. And we sent in teams of our emergency staff to help them to lay out their plans diocese by diocese so that they were as prepared as they possibly could be for whatever was gonna happen. They've used those funds to purchase supplies. If we have in staff uh, and are providing financial management, logistics support, procurement support, grants management support uh, from Poland and other neighboring countries. We're also supporting a Caritas cross-border hub located in Poland, which is ordering initially 80,000 food packets and shipping them into Ukraine. Also in Ukraine through Caritas, we're supporting field kitchens that are providing hot meals to people who have lost their homes, reception centers at train stations and other locations that are providing basic supplies for people on the move transportation for displaced families in order to help them to move, particularly the most vulnerable people who don't have cars, to move to FENS families, social service centers, um, lots of other areas of support that CRS and the church are providing through Caritas within Ukraine. Um, but it's really uh, incredibly difficult. And uh, this is a picture of a, a young woman and her child inside Ukraine. Here is a, um, you know, a, a hot, hot soup, hot coffee meal uh, reception center in Ukraine. Um, and here is a, a, also in um, a city called Burislav in Ukraine, a Caritas social worker, Maria Pilubna, is working with children who have 
um, who have been affected by the war. They're terrified, they're cold, they've kind of closed up. Um, and the Caritas staff are engaging with them to play, to paint, and to create a safe space where they can begin to work through uh, what happened and kind of reestablish the kind of human contact that we all need to get to the other side of these kind of traumatic experiences. Let me talk about um, Moldova. Moldova is a country that probably hasn't exactly been on the tip of anyone's tongue uh, any time in the recent past or at all. It's a small country about the size of Maryland in between Ukraine and Romania with a population of about 4 million. It's one of the poorest countries in Europe. Um, and it's um, coincidentally, actually, CRS has had a program there for a number of years that's been focused on um, helping orphanages to transition to providing family support so that kids uh, can be cared for within families and communities and not in institutions. Those skills and that experience allowed us to be registered in the country, to have the relationships with Caritas, and also to have experience in child protection and in safeguarding, which is so critical. Caritas Moldova, our partner there, is working with the local authorities and with parishes reach many of the refugees who've crossed the border, providing food, water, hygiene packs, as well as social and emotional assistance to hundreds of people, especially women and children, in government refuge centers in a number of different cities. Um, they're also providing cash grants for Moldovans who are taking Ukrainians into their homes. It's uh, I was talking to one of our staff members in Moldova yesterday who was telling me how striking it is, as it so frequently is, that the poorer people in Moldova are the most generous and are the ones who are opening up their homes. And um, we're trying to just kind of take the edge off that by uh, providing cash grants through Moldova so that those families um, are able to, uh, to, to provide the support that's needed. Um, so that's, um, that, that's, that's what we're doing in Moldova. Um, a couple of pictures, uh, oops. Um, the uh, picture on the right is a picture of a Maxime, who's a three-year-old who's just crossed the border with his sister uh, and his mother and his grandmother are not in the picture. They fled bomb attacks in um, Odessa. Um, left hand, the young woman and the child, her name is Anastasia, she's 20. She also fled the bombing in Odessa with her daughter, Kira, uh, who is seven months old. Um, she had to leave her husband and Kira's father behind in Kiev. Uh, and she told, um, uh, told our staff that she's very worried uh, whether she will see them ever, see him ever again. And she's terrified that her daughter is gonna grow up without a father as we all would be, of course. And then in the lower left-hand corner, um, Sophia in the red hood fled after a bomb exploded in the family garden in Odessa. And um, she told one of our staff that a lot of bombs went off and she saw people dying. So the, the, the experience of living through this kind of war um, is, you know, um, is what children are faced with. And we're working again, as I said, with our care test partners to address that trauma. Here are um, uh, NGOs and volunteers from different Moldovan vi villages who are helping refugees on the Ukraine-Moldova border. One of the really just inspiring things to me is the solidarity that um, Moldovans, Poles, Romanians have shown to their brothers and sisters in Ukraine. There's been an outpouring of support locally uh, and volunteerism and um, doing everything they can uh, to be helpful. Um, here's another picture of, of um, refugees who have crossed the border and are receiving um, some basic supplies from a Caritas distribution. Finally, I just want to uh, mention that Caritas Moldova uh, is running a number of um, reception centers where, and, and the, that are um, my colleague yesterday described to me as, as like quiet, 
comfortable places where, where families can kind of regroup and uh, have an internet connection where they can contact other family members who have fled or in other countries and where they can think and pull themselves together after uh, and sleep and, and, and take a hot meal and stay as long as they need to while they figure out um, what's next for them. You know, these are major life decisions that have to be made um, in an instant. And um, we feel really grateful to be able to help provide for families in this kind of situation, a place where they can make those decisions for themselves uh, in uh, with 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 a, a modicum of peace and calm, uh, and you know, um, so um, that's uh, just a, a wonderful picture here of of one of those centers. Um, and it's a great honor for us to be a part of the response in Moldova and. Um, our, and to partner with Caritas. Let me talk a little bit about Poland and, uh, and Romania. Uh, Caritas Poland, as you know, po Poland is a Catholic country, um, a huge amount of capacity. I, I was talking to a, another one of my colleagues, our colleagues, who when she arrived in Poland, she checked into a hotel, she turned on the television, and there was on television a fundraising concert organized by Caritas Poland for uh, refugee assistance from Ukraine. So these, again, are organizations that have a lot of capacity, but not a lot of experience in this kind of thing. And so the help is just absolutely critical. Um, Caritas Poland has been coordinating closely with the government and local diocesan partners, and other Caritas organizations like CRS, providing tents of hope that um, is are basically their reception centers that they've set up in a number of boarding crossings where arrivals, again, have the option to rest, receive food, tea, coffee, warm clothes, hygiene items, medicines, whatever they need. Um, CRS is in the process of rolling out through Caritas Poland an electronic financial assistance system to 300,000 Ukrainian refugee families. This is likely in the form of a, of a kind of a debit card that allows families to buy supplies specific for their own needs while they're on the move. And it gives CRS uh, the ability to account for those funds, but it also provides people with the dignity of choice. And this is something we've really found in, um, in our work around the world that, uh, I mean, a lot of people want to give stuff, but um, when we give, provide families with, uh, with cash, they get to choose what they need and what, um, and, and that in this kind of situation where you've lost all your, all your feeling of agency, all your sense of freedom, to be able to decide what kind of food you're gonna eat, what kind of diapers your child, you want for your, on your child or whatever, uh, really makes it, um, it gives a sense of dignity and of, of, of um, agency that's really important to people's sense of self-worth. We have six staff right now embedded in Caritas Poland. They're helping with financial management, grant write, writing, procurement, uh, management support. Uh, and through that, uh, we're providing um, just uh, in a huge amount of assistance. In Romania, um, where CRS has not been for a long time, um, we are supporting Caritas to set up refugee centers in a number of different cities that are offering um, uh, accommodation, meals, and transportation for beneficiaries. There's been a, a kind of a, a volunteer uh, effort to drive people from the border to the capital and then from the capital to uh, the next border, uh, which has really been heartening to see. But there have been signs of organized crime activity on both sides of the border. The risk of human trafficking is high. So we're working with Car Caritas in order to make sure there are systems in place to keep people safe. Um, here are just a number, some pictures of folks in Poland, Caritas Poland volunteers, staff and volunteers, uh, working with talking, making comfortable uh, refugees, help providing information, helping them to understand their situation and what they can get so that they are uh, again, feeling a sense of uh, agency and control uh, within the limits of, of their situation. Um, 
Artas Poland volunteers here are providing food, and this is a town called Budomierz, a Polish town that borders with Ukraine. Again, lots of uh, lots of volunteers from Poland um, helping their brothers and sisters. This is a, a, a refugee center and a train station, again, supported by Caritas. Uh, as you can imagine, so many people coming, arriving by train, getting off the train, not knowing what to do or where to go, exhausted, but at least getting uh, getting a place to sit, to regroup, food, and basic supplies. In addition to working with Caritas Moldova and Caritas Poland in Romania, um, Caritas staff and volunteers through, um, throughout Eastern Europe are working uh, tirelessly to prepare uh, for this dangerous and volatile situation. In Slovakia, Caritas staff and volunteers from four dioceses are um, coordinating a response to meet the refugee crisis. We're just beginning to support them. In the Czech Republic, Caritas is also beginning a refugee response. There's about uh, over 25,000 that have arrived already, and it, we expect it to continue increasing. Um, and then in um, Caritas Hungary, it's cooperating with various dioceses with uh, honest, unpronounceable names, I'm not even going to try, um, where people are fleeing uh, and, again, rest in a warm place until relatives in Hungary can pick them up or reach them at a reception station. Finally, in Bulgaria, uh, where my daughter lives and where I was just two weeks ago, um, diocesan offices are supporting arriving families, women and children with housing, food, hygiene items, medical social assistance. Um, let me talk a little bit about the future uh, and, and some of the things that are on our mind. Um, the standard disclaimer, I would say, is I don't think anybody has the faintest idea really what's going to happen. And what I mean by that is um, where the conflict itself is going to go, how long it is going to last, whether Russia will end up taking over some or all of the country, whether Ukraine will manage to maintain its territorial integrity, whether there'll be a negotiated peaceful settlement, how long any of that would take, we really don't know. And I think it's um, anyone who, who, you know, the um, uh, pundits are all um, opinionating about it, but I, I, I think we're, um, uh, prefer to just 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 prepare for the uncertainty that we're facing, and um, so we're just going to have to see. We are very concerned about food prices, um, both in Europe and around Ukraine, but also, uh, frankly, globally. I was last week in um, Gaza, in Palestine, and was in a grocery store that a uh, little shop. A grocery store is probably a bit of a bigger word than the little shop that I uh, was in. But nonetheless, it's a shop that Cirrus is supporting to provide basic supplies to the most vulnerable people in Gaza. And I was talking to the shopkeeper and he pulled off the shelf for me flour, sunflower oil and yeast, all of which was produced in Ukraine and Russia. And 30% of the wheat supply around the world is grown in Ukraine and Russia. Much of the sunflower oil, other uh, staple food commodities. And uh, if those commodities are off the market for a significant period of time, that's gonna really hurt food prices and that always hurts the most vulnerable. Global needs right now, the Ukraine crisis is on top of Afghanistan, which was on top of Ethiopia which is on top of a broader Horn of Africa uh, food security situation. And so um, we are fighting very hard in our Congress to, um, to provide adequate uh, assistance to meet these food security needs, as well as, of course, and I forgot to talk about COVID and the primary and secondary impacts of COVID. It is uh, an extremely concerning situation, one that you know we are well positioned to do our part. The church is well positioned to do its part, but is really quite um, quite overwhelming. Um, I want to finish with a couple of quick things. First, um, I would urge everybody to pray. 
And the Holy Father has been asking us to play, pray. We believe, I certainly believe in the power of prayer and the potential of prayer to affect the hearts and minds of people around the world, particularly in leadership. Um, so I'm certainly asking God to intervene on behalf of the most vulnerable and bring peace and justice uh, to this situation. Um, we would welcome uh, financial contributions to the work of CRS. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. The rebuilding uh, beyond the emergency response here, the rebuilding of Ukraine, uh, particularly for the most vulnerable people who always fall through the cracks, is going to be a massive endeavor, unfortunately. And then we would invite folks to join in advocacy actions to ensure that there are adequate uh, resources available. Um, you can join us and follow us on social media and uh, participate in our advoca advocacy efforts um, uh, through, through that. Um, finally, today is the uh, St. Patrick's Day. And of course, as an O'Keefe, it's a big day for me, but it is also in the Holy Land, the commemoration of the flight into Egypt of the Holy Family. And it's a day where we remember that Jesus himself and the Holy Family were refugees and, where, uh, and that therefore the foundation of our faith is in helping the stranger and the orphan and the widow. And um, what we are seeing in Ukraine right now is the need to respond to that call of the gospel. And um, I thank you all for your interest and for your attention. And I really look forward to engaging in some discussion later on in the program. And with that, I think I will turn it back over to Jack and Layla. Okay. Bill, we, we really can't thank you enough for really what is an astounding testimony of uh, courage and faith and hope. And we thank you for making the time. And I'm looking forward to the question and answer period too. But first, we're going to give all of us a chance to talk with each other. We're going to break into small groups for about 15 minutes. And uh, Leela is going to post uh, a few questions in the chat that you can talk together with that are related to Bill's presentation. So can I uh, just suggest as, a, as the course going forward, you introduce yourselves and then just jump right into the questions or whatever is on your heart. You don't, don't be limited just by the questions. You feel free to talk about what you want to talk about related to uh, Ukraine. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope your conversations were uh, energizing and helpful. Um, I don't see Bill yet back. So do you see him, Leela? I'm here, whether you see me or not. Oh, there you are, oh, there you are Bill. <laughs> oh, good. Well, we were relying on you for this Q&A, so it's good to see your face. <laughs> um, Bill, I got uh, I first of all, I want to tell everybody, please feel free to start to send your questions to me, um, and I'll be glad to sort through them. I've got a few uh, in advance, and so we can get started with those. Bill, this is um, one I think it's important uh, for those who are not familiar with the work of CRS. Somebody asked the question, you know, does CRS just serve Catholics, just Christians, just people mm -hmm. of faith? Who does C in this situation? Who is CRS actually caring for? And I, I know you want to answer that question. Fantastic question, thank you. So uh, we help any anybody and everybody, irrespective of creed. Uh, our mission is very clear. We are created by the bishops of the United States to help uh, everyone or anyone anywhere irrespective of creed and based on need. And so in this situation, it turns out most, most but not all, most uh, people are Christian, mainly uh, Orthodox, but also there are some Catholics, but there's also a Muslim and Jewish minority uh, from Ukraine and we are uh, helping them as well in, in a completely um, equal and equitable way. Thank you. Um, a couple other kind of um, uh, logistical questions or, or uh, trying to get the sense of the terrain. Uh, Bill, do you have any sense of what the percentage of children in Ukraine is and how that sort of matches up with other countries? Is, is it, uh, is it a, a country with a lot of kids uh, or, yeah. 
So I don't have exact figures, but what I do know is that part of the world in Eastern Europe um, is has um, some of the lowest birth rates in the world. And um, I would imagine that there, your average um, woman of childbearing age has less than two children per woman, which basically means that they're not replacing their population. And I wouldn't be surprised if their population is slowly declining or is relatively stable. What that in societies that have that kind of um, uh, those kind of demographics um, are going to be older and have fewer children in them than, you know, again, in countries like uh, where I lived in Tanzania, where, um, you know, your average family size had five or six, 5.6 kids or something like that. And um, the population was growing at a couple percent a year. So, um, but it's, you know, there are 40 million people. And so if there's 15 million children or something, that's a lot of, that's a lot of kids. There's, there's, so, um, and a million of them have fled so far and, uh, and there are millions more that are either displaced or are hunkering down. Mm -hmm. Bill, can you say anything about, um, how CRS collaborate or Caritas collaborates, uh, in the, uh, in the, in, in this environment? And are there significant actors um, that you would just highlight for everybody's knowledge to know who's who else is there and, and, and the good things they might be doing? Sure. So um, one of the things that um, in, in a situation like this, actually, because it's it's, you know, European countries that are relatively well off, again, compared to much of the rest of the world, there's not a lot of infrastructure of kind of the normal humanitarian groups that operate in other parts of the world. CRS was, because we're part of this global Catholic network and every country has a Catholic charities of sorts, that's our natural partners. Um, we have access pretty much everywhere where other, there are other groups that are, um, you know, having to register with the governments before they can do anything. Cause it's, you know, like any country, if you're a foreign organization, you can't just come in and start doing stuff. You have to, the government has, you have to apply, the government has to approve you and all that kind of thing. So we're in a very privileged position as part of the Catholic church network that we already have done all that. Um, because, um, because we're there, we're always there. Um, the UN and the United Nations is very active. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Uh, we have gotten some support for our efforts there uh, as well. Um, I know that Save the Children is there. Um, I know that Mercy Corps is there. Um, I am not sure what other groups have yet uh, yet established. The International Rescue Committee is there. Um, they have a special. Uh, ministry tour. I mean, it's not ministry is the wrong word. Their their work is around refugees, and so um, they are there. So there are there are certainly other groups. There's in major emergencies like this, um, the UN kind of provides the overall coordinating framework, and it's organized in what's called the cluster system. So that the UN will organize meetings around food, water, shelter. There'll be a lead agency in each of those sectors and the major groups will coordinate their activities to make sure there's not duplication and people aren't kind of stepping all over each other. Um, it's tough. I mean, it, particularly in this kind of situation, that's very fast moving, but, but there is a structure for coordination that um, uh, while imperfect, you know, serves, essentially serves the purpose. We also work very closely with donor governments. The U.S. government uh, has the Agency for International Development. It's uh, and our American taxpayers are um, international government uh, foreign assistance agency. They are providing funding um, some to us and to, to other groups. And so there is there is um, you know, there is a web of, of organizations and institutions working together. The Catholic Church's web is really extensive. And it, it, as I said, it is really heartening to see the solidarity of um, uh, countries from all around the world um, 
the Japanese Caritas, for example, is funding the, um, you know, there's just lots of, lots of good people everywhere who are trying to get to do what they can. Yeah. Bill, one of the um, images that um, many of us um, uh, unhappily saw in the news was, of course, the, 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 uh, the, the people of color being denied access yeah. across the border. Can you, uh, can you comment on that or give us any insight into that or, or anything, how CRS has responded to that? So um, uh, that was a terrible incident. And I think, you know, there's, um, like in many countries, uh, endemic race, racism uh, in Eastern Europe and in Ukraine. And um, what our team has told us is that the, um, the institutions and governments in charge of those border crossings have kind of gotten their act together and prevented that from happening. Again, I can't, of course, attest to that. I certainly hope that that is true. Um, but that was really, yeah, that was that was really sad. And, um, um, you know, I think I, I've been to remote border crossings, and I don't think that those are necessarily in different parts of the world where uh, justice rolls down like thunder. Um, I think there's a lot of unaccountable um, officials in places like that. And, and I can only hope that the, the governments responsible have kind of cracked down on that kind of activity. Also under the category of headlines, uh, you know, some, at least some people were uh, aware of this uh, meeting between Pope Francis and the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church in which Sounds like Pope Francis didn't mince any words. Do you have any? Uh, do you have any insider information about that meeting? I have no insider information about that meeting, um, uh, except um, I was talking to a Vatican diplomat uh, or a former Vatican diplomat who's a bishop on our board. Uh, last night we had a board meeting, CRS board meeting today, and. And he was just saying that, you know, the, 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 the Holy See is, in, is, is trying to preserve a relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church that um, you might, folks might recall that um, Pope Francis met with the patriarch from Moscow in Cuba at the end of the Obama administration in a really historic meeting. I mean, a meeting like that had not happened in hundreds and hundreds of years. And so um, for kind of ecumenical affairs and trying to build Christian unity, the Holy Father is trying to preserve the relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church while also being clear about um, his perspective on the morality and um, of, of what's going on. And I think it's a very delicate, uh, a delicate dance. The, the Holy See, I think, always takes the long view in its diplomacy, and I think it can be frustrating sometimes uh, because they're, um, you know, I, I don't know, I'm, I might want them to push harder in a shorter term way, but they tend to look pretty far down the field in terms of their time horizon. And, um, I, I, you know, personally, I respect that. Um, so that's, I don't know if that counts as insight or just, you know, mumbling, but, but that's what I, that's my perspective and what I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one, uh, one of our participants tonight uh, is asking is, has there been a policy statement issued by the bishops or CRS that they can actually take to their local uh, legislator as a way of sort of trying to nudge them in a particular direction? So, um, there have been a couple statements by the U.S. Catholic Bishops Conference. There was one today, actually this morning, by the Administrative Committee of the Bishops. Um, those statements have focused on, um, they're getting increasingly specific as time goes on, but have really focused on calling for prayer, calling for a ceasefire, calling for a cessation of violence. They haven't been so specific about the United States and what the United States could or should be doing uh, beyond uh, providing assistance, which the U.S. is doing for um, humanitarian uh, affairs. It hasn't 
Um, so I would, I would certainly encourage you to go to the bishop's website, which is usccb.org, and take a look at what the, their recent statements. I, um, but I think that they're also, you know, um, I, I don't anticipate the bishops are going to be terribly specific about what to advise the U.S. government to do in terms of whether except to do everything it can to try to help negotiate a solution. Um, so, uh, because I'm not sure anybody knows what they should be doing. I mean, there's this obviously very delicate dance the U.S. government is trying to, uh, to, to be clear about what it thinks about the conflict and who's at wrong and who's at right, but not to, um, not to risk an escalation of the conflict and direct, uh, conflict between Russia and the United States, which would be, you know, extremely dangerous for international peace. So I'm not sure myself what I would do if I were them. And uh, I think the bishops are tend in this kind of situation tend to be cautious uh, and feel it's kind of outside of their expertise. So, but take a look. I'd be, you know, I'd certainly be interested in what you all think about what they've had to say. Um, and yeah, yeah. And we'll include, uh, let me just say this to all our participants on the call tonight, when Leela sends a follow-up email, we'll make sure that we have uh, those links to that information on the Bishop's website, as well as information for CRS if you want to give. Bill, here's a question I'm, I'm heartened by. Somebody wants to know, if they give a gift to CRS, can they earmark it deliberately for the Ukrainian crisis? Absolutely. Yeah, we've set up a fund, a separate fund for the Ukrainian crisis. And if you earmark your gift uh, for Ukraine or the Ukrainian crisis or the, or um, anything like that, it will go into that fund and be used expressly and explicitly and only uh, for that for that purpose. Yeah. Bill, can you give us a peek into uh, how decisions are made in Caritas headquarters about the, the, the safety of its staff? How does it na navigate the question of you know are people going to be able to live? you know, through this where they currently are? Um, so, um, you know, the, the, the in, inside Ukraine, we're, the, the, the security issues and safety issues are right now inside Ukraine. Uh, you know, all the other countries are, perf are perfectly safe at this point. Although, you know, there's certainly concern in Moldova be uh, because, if Russia were to invade other countries, the first one it would probably invade would be Moldova for a variety of reasons, geopolitical and kind of historical reasons. But, but, um, but inside Ukraine, you know, uh, my sense is, and from having been on the phone with with the head of Caritas Ukraine, they are um, uh, again the two offices which have been unable to operate. Um, have just just to be, it was just impossible. Most of the others are just really courageous people. They're staying um, and are are continuing to work. They're making those decisions on their own. There's nobody. The Caritas Network. It's a confederation. It's not a um, you know. It's not a hierarchy of sorts. I mean, like Caritas, the Caritas headquarters in Rome, Caritas International doesn't tell Caritas Ukraine what to do. Caritas Ukraine is an independent member organization that. That makes its own decisions. Um, the bishops uh, of Ukraine, I'm sure, are are are, are in touch. Um, you should know, you know, if you're interested, the Ukrainian Catholic community. There is a Ukrainian Catholic community in the United States, and um, their lead bishop is Bishop Gudziak, uh, G U D Z I A K. I think who is in Philadelphia. I had the opportunity to be with him two days ago at the National Press Club. He gave a press conference with the Ukrainian ambassador to, um, to the United States. He was impressive. Uh, he is kind of helping to coordinate assistance to the church and to the, in, to the bishops and the institutions of the church. We are coordinating with him. Um, and he's in touch with his brother bishops in Ukraine. So there is, but but the moral of the story is these people are making their own security decisions uh, based on their desire to um, 
you know, and the, the, the courage of your average Ukrainian, I think, is really pretty unbelievable at this point. And um, and I would say the same for for the care test staff. Yeah. Well, Bill, um, I'm going to conclude by just let, alerting you. To, I can't tell you how many messages I've gotten in the chat about just how appreciative people are mm-hmm. of the work of CRS. And um, if we could, um, as a community tonight, just uh, I won't unmute you, but if you could uh, give a silent clap for Bill's being present to us and the information he shared. It's just been so, so helpful, Bill. Thank you so much for being with us. I, it was just tremendously inspiring. Well, I just let me just say thank you to you, Jack and, and, and Layla and all of you uh, in the Just Faith Network, because um, you know, when I, like even when I was in Gaza, one of the messages I brought to them and which I will bring to our team in Eastern Europe is they are not alone and that they're behind them when they are assisting people behind them are hundreds and thousands of Catholics in the United States and supporters of CRS who out of uh, a deep faith and a deep love and deep compassion are, um, are praying and are supporting them. And I think, um, I, you know, it, it, I, that might, if, if anyone thinks that's sappy and I, I, my wife tells me I'm sappy, but if uh, I, I was myself in a bombing incident in Sudan in 1990 and I was getting on the plane to leave this airfield where the day before had been this horrible bombing. And a man walked up to me and said, I am so glad that you were here because if you weren't here, nobody would know what happened. And I think that sense of solidarity and that people are not alone and that there are people in far off places who care and who are willing to spend their evening learning about, praying about, thinking about, reflecting uh, is more meaningful than you may ever know to people who are going through these experiences. So uh, I wanna thank you on behalf of our team on the ground, on behalf of Caritas, uh, all the good people, and because I will let them know they are not alone. And and that is, um, yeah, I mean, that that's what keeps people going in this kind of situation. So thank you and God bless you all. And, and um, I wish you all a, a, yeah, a wonderful rest of your Lent. And, you know, let's hope for a joyous Easter. Yes. Thanks again, Bill. And just to restate, uh, Leela will be sending an email to all of you with a video link uh, to Bill's presentation tonight. Uh, that will include also the other links that I mentioned previously. So feel free. In fact, we encourage you to share it freely. I could imagine, for example, that tonight's presentation could be used in parishes all over the country to inform people about what's going on in Ukraine. And so please, please think of this video as a resource that you can share as widely as possible. Also in that email will be an invitation for you to join the Just Faith Network. Just Faith Ministries has an exciting slate of membership offerings scheduled for this year. So, for example, this past week, we launched our monthly scripture study entitled God in the Margins with scripture scholar Tricia Hoyt, and it was fabulous. And that's going to go on every month for the rest of the year. So be sure to check out what's happening in the Just Faith Network, and and please join today. And so I'd like to close with a prayer. Uh, The prayer I've chosen comes from a book. It's actually a compilation of prayers put out by Catholic Relief Services. And appropriately, the prayer book is called Prayer without borders. And this particular prayer is called to have hope. To have hope is to believe that history continues open to the dream of God and to human creativity. To have hope is to continue affirming that it is possible to dream a different world without hunger, without injustice, without discrimination, without war. To have hope is to be a courier of God and courier of people of goodwill, tearing down walls, destroying borders, building bridges. To have hope is to believe the revolutionary potential of faith, is to leave the door open so that the spirit can enter and make all things anew. To have hope is to believe that life wins over death. To have hope is to begin again as many times as necessary. To have hope is to believe that hope is not the last thing that dies. To have have hope is to believe that hope 
cannot die, that hope no longer dies. To have hope is to live. Amen. And thank you all for being with us and good night.